Hi, my name is Andrea Pittman. Welcome to the Pediatric Amplification Lab. Uh, this is our lab where we uh, test children and adults with hearing loss, mostly children, and our children are between the ages of about 8 and 12. And This area is for parents and siblings to wait while the children are on this side of the lab where we do the testing in a sound-treated room. And this is where the business of research really takes place, and this is where I spend most of my time. I think I have a real soft spot for children who cannot hear. They can't um, enjoy others around them. They can't enjoy the situation that they're in as much as a child who can hear well. And I, I worry for children who aren't able to laugh along with their friends because they didn't hear the punchline of the joke. They've just struck me as um, my favorite kids. What do you do with your hearing aids when sounds get too loud? I take them out or just turn them off. In the Pediatric Amplification Lab, we study the behavior of children and how they interact with the behavior of hearing aids. And the goal is to find the right hearing aid features that allow children to do what children need to be able to do. Because, like, it gets too noisy, I just turn them off. I understand. That's A lot of kids with hearing aids have to do that. So, um, And what we're trying to learn from this study is if there's a way that hearing aids can process the sound so it makes those loud sounds more comfortable so the hearing aid will adjust to sound better for you. And that's what we'd like to learn. Does that sound like something you'd like to help us out with? Yeah. Fantastic. The first critical accomplishment is that they need to be able to understand speech, and they need to understand it as well as possible. And when a child can't perceive speech, it, it sort of robs them of the foundation for all of the other things that they need to be able to do. The second critical accomplishment is that children need to be able to detect and recognize the environmental sounds around them. If we hear a car horn honking, we wonder if they're honking at us. So it becomes critical for children if they can't hear environmental sounds because then they may respond inappropriately and in some cases it risks their safety. Now the third critical accomplishment of childhood is that they need to be able to manage complex environments. We think about school as being a noisy place, I think most parents certainly, and professionals, but it's not just noisy, it's dynamic, and it has a lot of things going on at the same time, and the ideal amplification for them would be the one that helps them manage all of that input. And then the final accomplishment is that children need to be able to learn. Most children, by the time they're eight, when they just start really learning how to read and reading to learn, they know thousands and thousands of words. But it's not because they pick them up from reading, it's because they learn them by listening to others. And so a child with hearing loss is at risk for missing opportunities to learn. So again, the ideal listening uh, system, an uh, uh, amplification system, allows them to be able to detect and learn the words that are new to them in their environment. Arizona State University is in the southwest uh, region of the United States. And most of the year it's beautiful here, so it may sound like an uninviting place being in the desert, but it's actually a very lovely place to live. So good to see you. Thank you for coming. Phoenix is a really good place to be for this kind of research because there are it's a large metropolitan area, so we have a good population to work with. Um, if you'd like, you can go ahead and have a seat and make yourself comfortable, and we'll be in here. So you're going to hear a sound followed by a word, and I want you to tell me out loud if that word is a person, a food, or an animal. If you don't know, just say, I don't know. And then at the same time, you're going to be filling out this pattern recognition where you're going to see shapes, and you just circle what comes next. Okay. Animal. Food. I don't know. Amplitude compression has been around for quite a while. So when amplitude compression came along, it was a wonderful thing. So it is a little bit more of a variable type of amplification. So for softer sounds, the hearing aid applies more amplification, but for louder sounds, it applies less amplification because the hearing aid user doesn't need louder sounds any louder than they already are. 
Each of the stimulus files that we used had contained three waveforms, and we put them together to create an auditory scene. And so what I'm showing is amplitude as a function of time. And these are the three waveforms. The most prominent waveform is the first one. It's the loudest, and that's the triggering stimuli, which triggers the amplitude compression. And that's followed by a target. In this case, it's the word girl. And um, it's usually at a lower level. And then the third the third wave file is just this background, low-level background playground noise. In the non-overlapping condition, the, tar the trigger and the target are separated by about a half a second. Uh, whereas in the overlapping condition, the trigger and the target are overlapping by about half of the target. So uh, only a portion of the target is actually made available to the listener. So this is that uh, portion where the amplitude compression speed is very important because if it recovers quickly enough and clearly enough, then the, it will, this a little bit of information will be able and available to the user. Until recently, manufacturers had to choose how fast or how slowly they wanted their amplitude compression speed to work. And they really had to use a philosophical decision because the research suggests that either is just as good as the other. Um, although there is a price that you pay for using fast or slow compression, and so it's really a choice between which one is the least objectionable. For fast-acting compression, because it works so quickly, it can distort the speech signal. Slow-acting compression doesn't do that. It has a nice, crisp, clean speech signal because it works very slowly on the signal. But the problem with slow-acting compression is that it's kind of behind the times. It's slow, slowly responding to changes in the level. So if uh, the hearing aid receives a very loud input, it will very quickly reduce the gain for that signal. But when that loud sound is over and it's followed by a softer sound, it takes that hearing aid a while to get back up to the amplification of that's necessary for that low level sound. And even though it's on the order of about a half a second to maybe up to two seconds long, what the hearing aid user hears is that after a loud sound, there's a, been a period where the hearing aids don't seem to be working. And so they will complain that hearing aids sort of drop out every time something loud happens. And so it's like the hearing aid kind of pumps in and out. Ideally, what we would like is a system that combines the best of slow acting compression and the best of fast acting compression. And that's what has been done in adaptive compression, particularly what Oticon has designed in their SpeechGuard E. And so in that system, the, uh, the compression is activated very quickly for loud level sounds. That loud sound is being monitored constantly. When that loud sound is over, then the, and it's followed by a softer sound, the hearing aid responds very quickly and brings up the proper amount of amplification, but then it works on very slowly so that it doesn't distort the speech signal or raise the background noise. So it's really the ideal system. A doorbell. A doorbell, yeah. Okay, we need to calculate his amplification parameters. Can you show me his audiogram? Yes. What kind of hearing loss does he have? He has a moderate to moderately severe sensory hearing loss bilaterally. Okay, um, can you go ahead and read me his thresholds and start with the right ear? Yes. Right ear, mm -hmm. 40, 50, 65. We were interested in doing this study of looking at the effects of the speed of amplitude compression in children and adults for a number of different reasons. The, probably the primary reason was to determine if the speed of the amplitude compression affected a child's ability to manage their environment. Um, and then the same would be true for adults with hearing loss as well. But we also were um, interested to see how the fast, slow, and adaptive compression type systems compared to one another uh, for just your basic uh, understanding and ability to interact with different uh, sound stimuli. <sighs> So we had to design very specific stimuli that included both speech and environmental sounds and background noise, and nothing like that had ever been done. And when we do that, we, we will recruit four groups of listeners, normal hearing adults and children and, normal, and hearing impaired adults and children. The normal hearing adults performance tells us what the maximum amount of performance is for our task. 
And that's what we use as a benchmark to compare all of the performance of all the other groups too. So that's our ultimate there. So you're going to hear a sound followed by a word, and I'd like you to tell me if that word is a person, a food, or an animal. And then children with hearing loss are really our target group, and we just want to know if their poor performance, because we it's almost always the case they do more poorly, we want to know if that's because they're kids, or if it's because they have hearing loss, or if it's because they're kids with hearing loss. So, and that's an addition or a multiplication of some kind, and they, by using those four groups, we can tease out those effects. The easiest way to understand the differences in performance between the slow, fast, and adaptive compression is to listen to the stimuli and also to look at a graphic representation of them. So what it shows is the combination of the three wave files together. So here is the bird call in this particular example, and it sounds like a chicken clucking. And then buried within that, or partially buried within that, is the word lifeguard. And so the first portion is in and being masked by the bird call, whereas part of that word is not being masked. And and that's what the listener needs to hear in order to make a judgment. Now, when it's processed by slow compression, the waveform shows that the bird call, the amplitude of the bird call is reduced, which is what we want to see. That makes it comfortable for the hearing aid user. Because the slow compression has, uh, takes its time to get back up to uh, an amplitude that's appropriate, or appropriate amplification, we see that the uh, overall increase in the amplification over time, and you can hear it in the signal. So with fast compression, we see a similar effect on the bird call. It reduces the amplitude there to make it comfortable, but it also uh, it gets back to its original amplification very quickly, but, so it's louder overall, but it's louder because it's amplifying some of that background noise, and that's what makes it a little bit more difficult to pull the word out of the noise. And so you'll hear this as a little bit louder and a little bit noisier. When it's processed with adaptive compression, you see similar effects. The amplitude of the bird call is reduced, but what you'll hear is a cleaner, clearer signal for the portion that is not being masked by the environmental sound. And when you put all three of them together on the same graph, what you see is that there's very little differences here, but there is a bit more of a, a clear difference between the adaptive compression and the other two, and those little differences actually make large uh, differences in the performance. When the best of both the slow and the fast uh, compression characteristics were put together in the adaptive system, the performance of both groups increased significantly and they both received the same amount of benefit. So although these bars look a little bit different, they are statistically the same. And so both groups benefited from the adaptive compression. Our overall conclusions from this study was that the adaptive compression parameters have real potential to benefit children and adults who are in dynamic, active listening environments, particularly like those at school. Anyone who is in a more quiet and stable environment would still receive benefit from, this, from an adaptive compression system simply because it would still be using the optimal parameters of both fast and slow compression. Hi Sam, thank you for participating and coming today. Thank you for having us. My ideal future is to see hearing aid manufacturers and designers to be able to really get down to the perspective of the, the child with hearing loss when they're designing features for children. And some companies like Oticon do that very nicely and they, they get it, they understand kids. Um, but there is this gap between what children with normal hearing kids can do and what the children with hearing loss can do. So my ultimate goal would be to close that gap and figure out how we can best get a clean, clear, amplified signal to children with hearing loss so that they don't miss as many opportunities to learn new words, learn about their environment, learn about the world, and communicate with their friends so that they can uh, go through particularly those delicate teenage years and into adulthood 
a healthy and whole person because those children will have hearing loss for the rest of their lives. Well, anyone interested in learning more about the details of this study can read the published article in the Journal of the American Academy of Audiology.